Well, welcome to the Daily Word from the Teaching Ministry of Redeemer Bible Church in Gilbert, Arizona. My name is Tim, and I'm one of the pastors here. Well, today we are going to be in Chapter 7 of Matthew. This particular section is the final of the three chapters that recount the Sermon on the Mount. It is full of practical and life-changing advice on how to live out the Christian life before the face of God for his glory and before others. It begins with perhaps the most misused and misapplied verse in the Bible. It begins, judge not that you be not judged. You can see the problem right away. You can't judge me. From personal experience, this has been used against me as immunity to judgment. As in, I can do whatever I want, and you cannot react or assess or have an opinion. It is a get-out-of-jail-free card. A lot of ink has been spilled trying to explain the meaning and the application of this passage. To judge can mean to decide, to distinguish, to condemn, to avenge. It can actually mean to damn. These verses do not mean that a godly person is forbidden to judge others, but it does mean we are not to judge the inward motives of others in the sense of condemning them. We do not know or understand why a brother in Christ does a certain thing. We only see outward acts. The point is how we judge. It is in love because you care. It is, our chance to, it is not our chance to rebuke or hurt or even destroy a person. My wife has a parenting move that can illustrate this simply asking when someone is judging or telling you about something that somebody has done. She would say, are you telling me to get them in trouble or out of trouble? And that's just a key, simple way to look at it. It's a way to determine where your heart is. What are you trying to do? The log reference is funny at some level, but yes, God does have a sense of humor. I see it as having blinders, and it blocks your view and distorts the view we have of ourselves and our, and our personal holiness. Judging is a road that has to be prayerfully and carefully walked down. It is always about motives and the level of equity or investment you have on the person you are judging tread lightly. The next section can be linked to the first if you're looking for guidance about approaching a person about an issue with their choices. It begins in verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be open. Pray and pray again. Ask God to search your heart. This will make me sound way holier than I am. But before I walk into a room or talk to somebody, my prayer is give me the words or no words to engage with the people you have surrounded me with. It puts me in a posture of reliance on him and not my vast oratory skills and wisdom and knowledge. I know I'm needy and weak and need God to guide me at all levels. It ends in verse 11. How much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You can see how that might be abused in a prosperity angle, but to me it is a simple reminder that God is for us and is always caring for us and should be greatly comforting in the deepest part of your heart and soul. Verse 12 through 14 is an abrupt shift. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets, the golden rule. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it by enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few the transition here from serving a good and loving god to a serious call to faith and the ruggedness of the christian life this is no walk in the park he didn't say the way is easy and without problems he says it's tough and few find it this shouldn't be discouraging it's discouraging it actually should motivate us to seek and search and find the lord the previous verses tell us of a good and loving father. He is that for sure, and we are called to pick up the cross and run after him. Not just on Sunday, but all the time and in everything we do. Verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, and the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, and nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. But we need to be professional pruners. Take the initiative through prayer and honest reflection. Ask others who you trust to show, show you your warts. Let them judge you. 
that it's too important to be deceived by our own personal wolves. We are essentially blind to ourselves. So I beseech you, ask people to help you along the way. We cannot do this alone. Well, verse 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That is a convicting and frankly frightening verse, set of verses at some level. We make broad assumptions about our status with God. Well, I'm a pastor. You know my stuff. I scanned my resume over to you, God. Did you not get that? You've seen the fruit. Again, draw near. It is the living God who desires your closeness. It is like your husband who says to the wife after she tells him, you never say I love you anymore. And he says, I told you the day I married you. If anything changes, I'll let you know. Wrong. Finally, build your house on the rock. Verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does not and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. These last two days in Matthew 6 and 7 have been foundation building. We're always looking to strengthen that foundation. Maybe do some remodeling, some adjustment, growing our roots deep and wide. This is a process. I would really encourage you to spend a lot of time in, in the early parts of Matthew up through at least 8 to where we're at and beyond. Um, really dig into it. These are such foundational truths that sometimes we just sort of take for granted. So you could spend a lot of time in these sections, so do. Is deep and convicting. We're being called to do something, and honestly, the bar is high. And we in our humanity could never come close to reaching those levels. But we have a gracious and loving Father who is looking us straight in the eye, holding our hands firmly and with a look that only a great dad can produce, say, saying to us, Come on, I can help you. I will pick you up when you fall and embrace you and discipline you. You are my child, and my love and care for you has no bounds. So the word for this section is choose. Rest in that. We'll pick up on the journey tomorrow in Matthew chapter 8. Be good.